welcome to all of our acorns out there. Thank you so much for watching our 2022 train song series. We're going to end this train song series with something that we've not done previously, which is to provide the song, the music, from someone other than me, my family, my friends, or local musicians that we know. Instead, this song, this train song, will come from a group of professional musicians. Before I say who that is and talk a little bit about this video, the first thing I want to do is say a huge thank you to Less Than Face Productions for sharing this video with us. It's not our video, it's, it's their video that they made and they did an excellent job. There are a lot of different versions of this song on YouTube, YouTube or a lot of different videos of this group performing this song and there's, there are a lot of them that are just fantastic. This one I thought was the best overall. Reached out to them and they were kind enough to let us use this video uh, in our video here on our channel. So please go over to their channel. There on their channel you can see not only videos of this group, but folks like Molly Tuttle, Billy Strings, uh, Tommy Emanuel, Sam Bush, Daryl Scott, Iron and Wine. The list goes on and on and on. And if you don't know who those folks are, you should head over there and find out. Because if you like our music, I guarantee you, you're going to like a lot of the music that you find over there on Less Than Face Productions. But just wanted to give that thank you and shout out to them. Now back to what we're doing in this video. I wanted to do this for a couple of reasons. One, I really wanted the opportunity to give my take, my breakdown of this song from really kind of a, the perspective of literary criticism. And also wanted to do this to show that not all great train songs, not all great music is from 50 or 100 years ago. Great music is still being made uh, today, and even great train songs are still being written in this century. Uh, this particular video is from 2014, and I think this song was recorded by this group even prior to that. Uh, the first time I heard this song was around two, 2017, and I heard it in person. But more about that, after we come back from the video of the performance, i am talk just a little bit about the musical performance of it and things that I noticed, and uh, then we'll get straight into talking about the song itself and why I think it's one of the greatest train songs ever written. So without further ado... Here is All Aboard, performed by the great Dale McCurry Band. I can feel the wheels are turning underneath my feet As I pull the shade down on my window seat Friend, where I'm going in You're traveling along By the way, son You forgot to say amen He said, I guess there's something here I need to explain I try to talk to everyone Riding this train Some of them listen The nose don't pay me no mind And the train keeps rolling The world keeps turning All the long Everybody's gotta get home. 
reacting to music but that was incredible and I saw that same song performed around 2017 maybe 2016 late 2016 in Franklin North Carolina I saw it performed by the Del McCurry band one other time in person and every time it was just amazing came home um, from that performance in Franklin came straight home downloaded the song from iTunes and listened to it over and over and the, the uh, studio version is great, but it's, it has nothing on their live performances of that song. Seems like every time they do it, and you can look around on YouTube, see what you think, but to me, it seems like every time they do it, they knock it out of the park. And I love to see them perform it live because it's such a physical thing. Uh, you know, you're standing up there in the lights, you got those lights beaming down on you, you're in, a, and you're in suits. You're playing these acoustic instruments when you have to physically, you know, provide a lot of um, sort of power and thrust to those instruments to get those sounds. So just an amazing performance, musically speaking. I said that I would talk a little bit about the musical performance. So one thing I would like to comment on as a guitar player, when you're playing a song that fast, it's almost impossible to play a standard rhythm unlike the mandolin and the banjo which play half time or the bass which only plays on the bass note a rhythm guitar player normally hits both the bass note and the half time or downbeat um, Dale being an old pro knows that it's not going to be very easy and might not even sound that good actually to try to play the standard rhythm on a song that fast so he's developed a sort of halftime but so that his halftime doesn't conflict with the halftime of the banjo and the guitar his halftime falls most of the time or at least part of the time on the bass beat now he doesn't play this the entire time he plays some standard rhythm some halftime rhythm and then also works in some guitar runs this along with alternating really between using primarily his arm or sometimes primarily his wrist allows him to rest and be able to play rhythm throughout this song but again not using the standard rhythm so here's just a little clip showing what I'm talking about that he does this is probably something he perfected over time to where he doesn't even have to think about it anymore he just makes it happen on these really fast songs <laughs> The other aspect that I'll comment on in terms of the musical performance, when it comes to train songs, most of the time the musical instrumentation needs to mimic or somehow musically make reference to a train. And this helps the listener 
sort of imagine and get the feel of the movement of the train. Of course, the, the most common way of doing this would be with a harmonica or a steel guitar to imitate the train whistle. But making a musical reference to the movement of the train, the sound of the train, happens three times in this song. The first time is when Jason Carter makes a train sound, or train whistle sound rather, with his fiddle. Friend, where I'm going is better than where I've been. The second time that the musical instrumentation in this performance makes reference to the sound of a train is with Jason's rhythm on the fiddle as we enter this particular verse he is making a rhythm that imitates sort of the clickety-clack rhythm of the train. Lastly, we have Jason and Ronnie joining together here on fiddle and mandolin creating what I would kind of describe as almost a telegraph sound. And telegraph is not the same as a train, but there's an association with the train. Um, to me, again, it still conveys that feeling, stirs that imagination for the listener uh, in terms of creating a train sound or a train feel. Let me real quickly say who the band members are. Uh, of course, you have the patriarch there, Dale McCurry, singing the lead, playing the acoustic guitar. You have Jason Carter, kind of down to Dale's uh, far right, playing the fiddle. Just, uh, wow, what a fiddle player. And you have uh, Ronnie, Dale's son, Ronnie McCurry, playing the mandolin, one of the greatest mandolin players of all time, obviously. You have his other son, uh, Rob McCurry, playing the banjo. Uh, does such a, a great job, tasteful banjo work, starting this particular song out, setting just the right tempo, and then just keeping that kind of rock foundation back there. They've had a, a, several great ba uh, bass players. I believe this particular um, bass player was uh, Alan uh, Tratham or Bartham, something like that. I should have looked that up. Before I started this video. But that's just a little quick blurb about the personnel that you see in this video. I could go on and on talking about Del McCurry and his history and the different configurations that he's had over the years, how his music got better and better as his sons uh, came along and kind of drove him to new heights and uh, new advancements in music. But that's not what this video is about. This video is about this song. Now one really smart thing about Del uh, Mr. Jason Carter, the fiddle player, told me uh, that very night in Franklin, he told me that Dale pretty much accepts and listens to any songs that are pitched to him. Meaning if he just gets a random demo tape uh, in the mail from some guy he's never heard of, he listens to it. Most uh, artists and musicians don't do that. Um, they ignore it. I've even known uh, quite a few that go so far as to immediately write unsolicited and then pay to ship it back and I'm thinking my goodness why don't you just throw it away you're gonna take the trouble to ship it back but anyway Dale listens to everything that he gets now I'm sure he gets a lot of garbage but chances are within 30 seconds or a minute of listening to a song he knows whether or not the song is any good he knows whether or not he's interested in it if he's not boom you just move on what what did you really lose there you know, half a minute, a minute. Um, but he has a lot of really unusual, really high quality songs. Unlike most bluegrass bands, they don't do a lot of just covering old, you know, uh, Stanley Brothers tunes and Flat and Scruggs tunes. If you get a, a CD of Del McCurry or the Del McCurry band and there's 10 songs on there, probably at least eight of them are going to be new songs. And he's also a good songwriter himself. 
but he gets so much material and he combs through that material that he he doesn't really need to write songs because he gets so many great songs that way. So kudos to him for doing that, and that is how he came across this song. This song has um, three authors, actually three writers, composed this song. I'm not going to try to remember the names just now, but I will put them at the bottom of the screen or in the description below. Uh, I'm going to start talking about this song. I've wasted enough, not wasted, I've taken enough time kind of getting to this point. My real goal is to talk about this song, and I am going to be looking over here to my right a little bit for some of my notes. So I mentioned that I'm going to look at it from the perspective of literary criticism. Specifically, I'm going to use something called New Criticism, which was a big literary movement in kind of the mid-20th century. And with New Criticism, you only focus on the textual evidence. You don't pull in things from the outside. For example, you don't say, well, around the time this song was written, this was happening in the government, or this was going on in American society. Or, I read a biography of the writer, and he was struggling with this in his life. You really don't bring those things in. You only look at the text to draw your conclusions or your interpretations of the piece. And that's the way I think it's best to approach anything, because if you do the other, if you do the alternative, I think you're more likely to, to make draw wrong conclusions. For example, if you know a a guy is, kind, or was, historically kind of a jerk or kind of a sexist, you can, real without realizing it, you can project that onto something that he wrote when it's really not there, when there's really no evidence in the piece that he composed of those elements or those ideas. So, new criticism, you just look at, at the writing. And I don't know anything about these writers so that part will be easy. I don't know anything about their, their lifestyle, their beliefs. I'm just going to look at, uh, at the text. Now, when we get into this, or when we get to the end of this, you're probably going to be in one or two camps. You're probably going to be like, well, you could be like, uh, well, duh, Paul, obviously. Obviously, that's what that song's about. Obviously, that's what that song is saying. Or you may be in the camp of, really? I didn't catch that in that song, or I didn't hear that in that song. If you wind up in that second camp, I hope you'll go back and listen to this song again. And if you're like me, you will get you might get a little something more out of it each time you listen to it and appreciate it uh, that much more. That's what I'm after, is to help you appreciate this song, because I love this song. It's a fast song. It's about four minutes, but if you were to time it, I bet almost a minute of that is actually just picking so it, it manages, this song manages to say a whole lot in a short amount of time. So here we go. Uh, here's some questions to think about. And to get maximum benefit out of this or maximum interest, you might want to pause the video right now and print yourself out or pull it up maybe on another screen, the lyrics to this song, so you can look around in the song for your own um, textual evidence for either agreeing with me or disagreeing with me or any kind of conclusion that you want to draw. So, this song is a metaphor. Now, there are different kinds of metaphors. Uh, your average run-of-the-mill metaphor, the writer just simply states one thing is another. Uh, he was a great bear of a man. Um, this, um, this relationship is a ball and chain. Uh, that's a directly stated metaphor. This is actually an implied metaphor, and it's also something called an extended metaphor, meaning the whole thing is kind of one great big metaphor that is pursued from beginning to end. Uh, the, the one that I know of that's probably best compared to this song is the Robert Frost poem, The Grindstone. Um, if you haven't read that poem before, you can go check that out. But it's very similar to this song in terms of the comparison that's being made and what it has to say about the real topic. So we'll talk about the real topic in, in just a second because it's a heck of a lot more than, you know, a, a, an engine and a, and a bunch of steel going down a, a, an iron track with crossed eyes. <laughs> that's in there, but it's really about a lot more than that. 
So let's start here. Who is the narrator um, that starts off talking in this song? This narrator doesn't really say a whole lot. And to me, and, and based on the few things that he does say, I would say this narrator is a kind of everyman. He's a sort of everyman. At the opening of the song, he's kind of dreading this long trip. He seems to be feeling a little bit of anxiety. Everybody can relate to that, right? So the narrator, I think, is to represent just your everyday common man. That leads to the next question. Um, what is the train? If the train is this extended metaphor. Now, you could say the train is to represent life. You could say it's even to represent salvation. That's getting a little bit ahead of us. Um, I would say and maybe this will make more sense later, but I would say the train is actually to represent those things and more. The train is really to represent our opportunity. But really before we can talk about that fully or understand that fully, we probably, the next question really probably should have been, who is the person, who is the character who talks to the narrator? Because that character, that second character if you will, actually does a lot more speaking than the narrator. Who is that? Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you several pieces of textual information that that person, that character, is God. When he first approaches the narrator, he's right at home. Now, that could just be he frequently rides this train. I think he's at home for a different reason, so we'll come back to that piece of evidence, but he's right at home. Here's a really good piece of textual evidence that the, this character is God. He knew the narrator did not finish his prayer with, with amen. Probably the narrator would have been uh, praying softly, maybe even silently, right? He's on a crowded train. He's probably not praying out loud. He's praying more to himself. Yet this character knows that he omitted amen, that he forgot to close the prayer with amen. This narrator knew that that character was traveling alone. Now obviously he could have kind of, you know, drawn that conclusion from looking at him, but he seems to know that with a lot of confidence. He seems to know that immediately. He was aware, this character, is aware of everybody else on the train, what they have been doing for quite a while, what they're doing at the moment, maybe even kind of what their current mood or state of mind is. Now, he's either just super observant, or again, this is a, a, a piece of textual evidence that this character is actually God. Another um, piece of evidence um, this is the one when I first saw this song performed there in Franklin that I literally got chills. And it's very early in the song, Dale sings this line. He said, I guess there's something here I need to explain. I've been trying to talk to everyone right in this train. Some of them listen, but most don't pay me no mind. Some of them listen, but most don't pay me no mind. First time I ever heard the song and I heard that line, that's when I knew uh, this is God that's, that's uh, speaking in this song. And I'll, I'll kind of try to illustrate that with that point that's being made in that part of the song with something that was shared to me by Arnold Matthews, one of my friends and mentors. Arnold's oldest son, uh, Colton I believe was his name, he went to UNC uh, to earn a degree. This is a very, very bright young man, would have been the valedictorian of his school, that particular school at that particular time, didn't recognize valedictorians, but he would have been. Very bright young man. He actually wound up going into seminary, which is kind of ironic given the story that I'm about to tell. I don't think that was his original plan, but that's what he wound up doing um, and studying, you know, in, in college. But anyway, Colton's first day there, one of his first days, he was in a religion class. And the professor asked a class of about 60 kids in an auditorium. He said, raise your hand if you believe that the Bible is the Word of God. You know, literally. This is God speaking to us 
That's what the Holy Bible is. Raise your hand if you believe that to be true. Colton told his dad that almost every hand in the auditorium went up. The professor said, thank you, put your hands down. Now, raise your hand if you have read the Bible or, that, or if you frequently read the Bible. Almost no hands went up. I think maybe only two out of the 60 went up. And the professor said, so let me get this straight. I have to wiggle my mouse. Let me get this straight. You believe that an all-powerful, omniscient God that created the universe and created you and created all these things, you believe that he wrote down messages to you, to us, in a book, and you haven't read them. Now, that's a pretty profound thought right there. We, we don't normally think about it in those terms, you know, of A, what do we believe the Bible is, and then B, how do we act on that belief? But I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think there are many people who believe it but don't necessarily read it. Um, so coming back to that line, some of them listen, but most don't pay me no mind. Um, meaning the riders of this train, which again the train is a metaphor, so really possibly meaning uh, considering the whole of humanity, some of them listen to me when I try to talk to them, but most don't pay me any attention. And that's, that's something we're going to talk about or I'm going to talk about a little bit later when I get into the themes of this, and I'll try to touch on a little bit of how are the ways that God tries to speak to us that are represented in this song? Uh, another statement that he makes that not by itself would be necessarily textual evidence, but combined with all these other sort of bullets or examples of textual evidence, um, is evidence that uh, this is God speaking. He's referring to the couple, and he says, I'm going to ask them what they saw at their journey's end. Now, he's on the train. You could go with a literal meaning like, hey, when this train pulls into the station and they're all getting ready to get off, he's going to say, hey, what would you see on this train? Uh, and, of course, you can have both meanings be true at the same time. But when you read or you hear that line of the song in the context of all these other thoughts, that sounds like more of a reckoning like when their life is over, when they have reached that final destination, that's when I am going to ask them. I'm going to pose the question to them uh, because that's my right. That's my position. I've given them this time, and when they get to the end of that journey, I'm going to be talking to them. I'm going to be asking them some questions. So those, that's one, two, three, four, five, six little uh, pieces of textual evidence that this character is actually God in this song. Uh, now, I'm going to do just a few pieces of textual evidence that this is not only God, but this would be the Christian God that's being represented in this song. Maybe to me, the most uh, clear piece of evidence is when the character says to the narrator, this is my stop, son, but you won't be traveling alone. Uh, automatically makes me think that this is an allusion to Christ leaving the disciples. Yes, I'm going away, but you're not going to be by yourself. I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you. Uh, also similar to that same moment, you know, Jesus ascends uh, into the sky in this song, when the narrator looks to try to wave goodbye to this character, all he sees is a light in the sky. So that, to me, points toward this being the Christian God, not just God in sort of the general sense or from some other religion. But these things <coughs> seem to indicate the Christian God. Also, the chorus and sort of the key phrase of the song, all aboard everybody's got to get on board. Uh, Christianity, unlike some religions, makes the claim, in a sense, of exclusivity. 
Jesus said, No man cometh to the Father except by me, through me. So in the Christian belief, the fundamental true Christian belief, um, Jesus is the one way. Um, now, I'll come back later to it's exclusive, but it's not exclusive. It's exclusive, but it's also the most inclusive thing ever in a, in a way of looking at that, I, I really believe. But uh, those pieces, those three details right there to me indicate that this is not only God, this is the Christian God in this song. So all that was sort of new criticism, you know, just straight from the text. I saw uh, Dell give this uh, performance, or his band rather, they performed at uh, one of the NPR Tiny Desk concerts. They did this song. Now here we'd be stepping away from new criticism, because what I'm about to say is not in the song. This is the singer of the song just making a comment outside of the song as he's introducing the song. He says, this is a song we've done for quite a few years. This is a gospel song. And then they, they sing the song. So in Del McCurry's mind, this is a gospel song. So that would seem to say that Del McCurry uh, would agree that this is a song about God. This is a song about the Christian God because he referred to it as a gospel song. Not a train song but a gospel song. Um, moving on to just discussion of, of what I think are the deeper meanings or themes in this song. I think one theme or meaning is in this song is that creation itself is evidence of God. Uh, the character, who again seems to be God, refers to the one lady who missed the lake at Horseshoe Bend, didn't see that. And, of course, refers also to that couple. They're not seeing what's going by, all the beauty that's outside those train windows. They're fo focused on a cookie jar. Um, the fella in the back, he has he's looking at the window, but he's not seeing anything. So one theme of this song is that creation is evidence of God. You can see it as such. You can experience it. You can pay attention to it, or you can ignore it. Uh, and the choice is up to you. And related to that, a theme or meaning of this song is if you ignore God, He will eventually leave you alone because you have free will. Uh, the Bible talks about a character named uh, Ephraim, Ephraim, and God actually said to one of the prophets, He's joined to His idols, leave Him alone, let Him be. He's happy with his false idols. I'm just going to leave him be. We're not going to entreat with him anymore. I don't want you necessarily, you know, going and try to persuade him or get his attention back on me. Just, just leave him be. Now that can be kind of hard to accept for some folks, but if you believe in God, you believe in Christ and the Word of God as it is in the Bible, then you know that God is perfectly fair, perfectly righteous, perfectly knowledgeable. So he would know when it's fair to just leave someone alone and when the Holy Spirit or the Word of God or just whatever means um, should be continued to should continue to be applied in order to uh, try to reach that person. So that's a sad line, actually, a sad word in the line when he's talking about the fellow in the back. He says, the fellow I left in the back. So it seems like God has, if you want to say, written off that person, but God has left that person in the back. So let's look at the the briefcase, the cookie jar, and the paper sack. The briefcase, I think, is a symbol of work. This lady has had her briefcase, briefcase open, according to the character, for close to 90 miles. So she's tied up in her work what she needs to get done, and she's not seeing everything that's going by. Now, you could say, well, she's not enjoying life. That's true, but I think this is more about not listening to God, not seeing the evidence there. Obviously, our jobs, our careers are, are very important, but if we're not careful, we can get so absorbed in that, that briefcase, that job, 
that we're not, um, that we're losing, that we're missing out on what God is trying to tell us, what God is trying to share with us, missing out on family, um, things that ultimately in the end will be of greater importance than our, our careers or our, our jobs. The cookie jar, I think, is just a symbol of um, things that are trivial, that don't really matter. You know, the greatest cookie jar there ever was, how important could it really be? But that's what this couple is focusing on, just like the lady with the briefcase, they're missing everything else. Not only that, but they're fussing about it. So instead of using their time, which we know is always ticking, to uh, be talking with each other about meaningful things, um, to express love for each other, um, they're fussing about something that ultimately really doesn't matter. And again, the character says, I'm going to ask them at the end, what did you see on your journey? I don't think they're going to have a whole lot that they can say if they were focused uh, to the point of arguing about things as trivial as a cookie jar. What is the paper sack? Well, I don't think the paper sack is necessarily a, uh, a symbol, as it is literally this guy has alcohol in this paper sack, and he is using it to keep the smile on his face. He keeps the smile on his face through a paper sack, is what the line says. So he is trying to make himself happy with this, rather than the other more lasting uh, more spiritual things of God that are available. One of my favorite puns in any song of all time, he can't see past the pain. He's looking out the window. I looked up the lyrics of this song on multiple sites. They always spelled it P-A-I-N. He can't see past the pain. Um, he seems like he's probably an alcoholic. He's, he's trying to treat his pain, whatever his issues are, with alcohol. But there's definitely a play on words there, a great pun. He's looking out the window, but he can't see past the pain. The window pane. Yes, the pain in him, but the window pane. He's looking at the window, but he's not really looking beyond the window pane to all that's there, um, this countryside that they're going through, which again, according to the Bible, is great evidence of God, the creation. So those symbols there, or those three items, I think, are very important. The briefcase, the cookie jar, the paper sack. Uh, I promise that I'm almost finished with this. Uh, a little communication goes a long way with God. I think that is another theme or meaning of this song. Again, the narrator said almost nothing. He said just his prayer at the beginning. The rest of the time, he was simply listening, listening to God what God had to say. Yet at the end of the song, <clears throat> he says that he feels much better. He feels that he knows where he's going is better than where he's been. Now again, you can take that as just literal. He's going to a better destination wherever this train's taking him. But I think that's meaning that final destination, that second life, he knows now it's going to be better than this life. And he knows that by listening to God and what God had to share with him and had to teach him and show him on this, this train ride. Um, so yeah, again, the, the narrator outside of his prayer really didn't, didn't talk back to God. He just, just listened to God. So coming back to, maybe this would be a good way to wrap this up, coming back to the idea of exclusivity versus inclusivity. Um, yes, Christ says, it must be through me, but he also says, let whosoever will come. So everybody on this train has this opportunity. They have the opportunity to look at the creation. They have the opportunity to listen to God in, in the many different ways He's trying to speak to them and reach them. But He will not force them to hear Him. He will merely speak to them for what He deems in all His wisdom to be um, an appropriate or a right amount of time. And then He will, he will not harass you. He will not force you. Um, but he is there. That's why I think I would rather say that the train is not so much a metaphor for just life or just salvation, 
but the train is a metaphor for our opportunity. So this entire life, this entire journey that we're on is our opportunity to hear these things that God is trying to show us, that God is trying to tell us. I try to talk to everyone riding this train. Some of them listen, but most don't pay me any mind. What a fantastic song. I hope you got something out of this. Um, like I said, you may have really picked up on all this, uh, but I do think sometimes, especially with a fast-moving bluegrass song like this, um, some listeners could just think, hey man, that's a really cool train song, and just have a surface understanding of, of what's there. Not that I'm by any means any kind of deep thinker or that I've cracked some kind of code in this song. It's not really obscured, it's just implied, and you just have to listen, I think, to the words as a whole and what were the writers of this song trying to say. Thank you for watching our Train Song series this year. I don't know if we'll ever do a, a um, video like this again where we do an analysis of a song, but this is a song that really can hold up to analysis. It has a great deal of substance to it. I want to one last time thank Less Than Face Productions for sharing this video. Um, if you're new to Del McCurry, go out there and hear some of his other great music. But this will always be one of my favorite Del McCurry songs just because of the depth and of the meaning that I feel is communicated in the song. Thanks again. Uh, come March, we'll do our story song series, Lord willing, and maybe we can post a few other songs between now and then. Hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving and a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.